Hello and welcome to Engaging with Islam. Today's topic is the Son of God and the Trinity. Now Sam, when Christians call Jesus the Son of God, this can be a stumbling block to Muslims, can't it? Absolutely. Why is that? It's because in the Quran, to say that Jesus is the Son of God is the worst sin you can commit. And in Surah 9 verse 29, it actually says that Christians are to be conquered and subjugated by Muslims if they say Jesus is the Son of God. And so it can be an idea that Muslims object to strongly. So when Christians face this type of rejection, what are some of the ways they may respond? Christians can respond a few ways. One of them may be to feel on the back foot and very defensive and to not really want to have to defend this doctrine to Muslims and not want to talk about it with them. But as Christians, we actually should be on the front foot, not on the back foot. Because what we believe about Jesus as the Son of God comes from the Torah, the prophets, the Psalms and the Gospel. We believe all the prophets. And what Muslims believe about the Son of God only comes from Muhammad. Can you explain more about that? In the Torah, Prophets, Psalms and Gospel, we see the idea of the Son of God. And so in Exodus chapter 4, we see that the nation of Israel is called the Son of God. They are to represent God in the world. They are to be holy as God is holy. They are to display His glory. They are, they're the Son of God. The next place we see it is with Israel's king when God makes a covenant with King David. We see this in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Here we see that the king of Israel is called the Son of God. They are to represent God in the world. They are to display his glory in the world and to be holy as God is holy in the world. And so we see this idea of the Son of God is a major idea in the earlier prophets. But when we read the history of the nation of Israel and her kings in the books of the prophets, we see that the Son of God, Israel, and the Son of God, the King of Israel, failed to live the way they should. Instead of living the holy life and showing God's glory to this world, they brought blasphemy to God's name. And so when we read the other prophets, we see that God has made a promise that he will send his true son, who will truly represent him in this world. And so the idea I just want to bring up there is that the idea of the Son of God is not a Christian idea. It didn't start with Christianity. It has a long history before Christianity. And so when we see Jesus coming and in the Gospels, we see him being the true son, truly representing God in this world. Well, this is just the fulfillment of what the earlier prophets had promised and said would happen. What did Muhammad teach about the son of God? Well, Muhammad completely denied the message of all of the prophets. Whereas in the earlier prophets, God's people were called the sons of God. In Surah 5 verse 18, Muhammad said God's people cannot call themselves the sons of God. And while Jesus is called the Messiah in the Quran, he's not the son of God, where in the earlier prophets, the son of God was the Messiah. And in Surah 39 verse 4, Muhammad said that Allah could have taken a son from what he had created if he wanted to, but he has chosen not to. And so in Islam, there is no expression of the Son of God at all. And again, this is very different to the Torah, Prophet, Psalms and Gospel, where the idea of the Son of God is all the way through them. And so we see that in the Quran, no one is a Son of God. All you can be is just a slave. So in Islam, you can only ever be a slave. That's right. But as we've seen, God's plan throughout the Prophets is to make us sons through Jesus Christ. So how should Christians talk to Muslims about the Son of God? Well, I think one way is to show Muslims that the idea of the Son of God did not begin with Christianity, but show them how it's there in the earlier prophets and how it comes to its fulfillment in Christianity. And I think a great way to do this would be you know, ultimately to get them to read, say, the Gospel of Matthew. But there's also a verse in Luke chapter 1, verse 35, which uh, is helpful to show Muslims when they ask us about how can Jesus be the Son of God. 
It's where the angel comes and speaks to Mary and he says, The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And I have found this verse to be a very helpful one for explaining to Muslims how Jesus is the Son of God. I'd like to now talk a little bit about the Trinity. What do Muslims believe about the Trinity? In the Quran, Muhammad rejected the idea of the Trinity. We see this in Surah 4, verse 171. And also in the Quran and in Islam in general, God is never called Father. It's not one of the names of God. And as we've seen, there is no Son of God. So when there's no Father and no Son, there's no Trinity. And so it's normally an idea that when Muslims hear it, they reject it. Should Christians be embarrassed by the Trinity? Absolutely not because it is the fulfillment of how God has revealed himself through all the prophets. So how do we see the Trinity in the Bible? Firstly, in the prophets before Jesus, they provide the grounds for understanding the Trinity. So if we have a look in Exodus, we read this. God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. And so what we see here is that God is progressively making himself known to us. He made himself known to Abraham, but he made more of himself known to Moses. And this is one of the ideas that holds the books of the prophets together, that God is revealing himself throughout all the prophets. Now, how do we see the Trinity being revealed? Well, I think first of all, we see it in the creation account where we see God, his spirit and his word bringing creation into being. We see those three responsible for creation. And when God makes man, we see that God says, let us make man in our image. And so God uses the plural to describe himself. And when God makes man in his image, that shows us that God is able to share his attributes and maintain his unity. And so that's important because it tells us a significant thing about God's unity, that he can share his attributes while maintaining his oneness as God. Another place we see it is that at a few points in the Old Testament, we're told that nobody can see God. Yet, well, there are also examples where people do see God. And so there is this one who represents God in the Old Testament that people can see. Another place we see it is with the father-son-spirit relationship we see throughout the Old Testament. So in the Torah, Israel is called the son of God. God is their father and God moves amongst his people by his spirit. And then, as we've seen with the king of Israel, he is called the son of God. And God is said to be his father. And this son of God is the spirit-filled son. And so we see the father-son-spirit relationship with the king of Israel as well. And the prophets, like particularly the prophet Isaiah, says that in the future, God is going to send his true spirit-filled son into the world to bring glory to God's name, salvation for God's people and judgment upon the nations. And so this idea of the Father, Son, Spirit is throughout the Torah, Prophets, Psalms and Gospel. And so these are the grounds that the prophets give us as God progressively reveals himself throughout the prophets. What about with Jesus? How did Jesus reveal the Trinity? Jesus is the true Son that God promised would come. And his sonship is completely unique compared to all the other sons. And so when Jesus' sonship is described, he's described as the word of God in John chapter 1 or as the glory of God in Hebrews chapter 1. And both of these descriptions are important because they're both monotheistic descriptions. There's only one God, God and his word, God and his glory. Yet the word and the glory come from God not by way of creation, but by way of the very nature of God. And that's the type of sonship that Jesus has. And so when Jesus comes to us, it's God coming to us. 
And so this is what we find with the descriptions of Jesus in the New Testament. They are deliberately monotheistic, yet at the same time revealing a diversity of persons within God. And so this is where our understanding of the Trinity comes from. And we also see this with the Holy Spirit. He is the spirit of the one God, yet a distinct person. And so the Holy Spirit is described in personal ways. He is the one who teaches us, the one who is our counsellor the one who is grieved when we sin, the one who can be lied to. When the Holy Spirit comes to us, God in his fullness has come to us. And this is also where our understanding of the Trinity comes from. And so we see that when the one God reveals himself, it is through the Father, Son and Spirit. And this is the doctrine of the Trinity, that there is one God with three distinct persons, Father, Son and Spirit. Another issue that comes up is that some people say the Trinity is not logical. Is the Trinity logical? Yes, it is. God is bigger, greater and more complex than us. And learning about him requires effort. We must not confuse this effort with saying it's not logical. That's right, because there are some other areas about God that also require effort to understand. Absolutely. Consider the sovereignty of God. God is sovereign over all things. Yet at the same time, we are responsible for what we do and will be held accountable for what we do. Now, both of these are true and we experience them to be true, but it takes effort to understand this. But it's not just God. There are many areas of life which require effort to understand. There are many areas of science which require effort and understanding the human mind requires effort. And so it is with the Trinity. Okay, well, what can we say about the Trinity and logic? Firstly, we cannot work out God's nature from our own reason. We need God to reveal himself to us. But now that he has, we can see that the Trinity is logical. Consider this. It's logical for God to be more complex than us. That's what we see in the scriptures. We're also told in the scriptures that God is personal. He's not a force but he's a personal God. We're also told that God is self-sufficient. That is, God did not have to create us, but he just chose to create us. Now, I think if you put these three ideas together, that God is more complex than us, that God is relational and self-sufficient, we can see that the Trinity is very logical. Because if God truly is self-sufficient and he is relational, then his relational aspects must be met within himself. Otherwise, he's not self-sufficient. He depends upon us to have any expression of his personal attributes. And so the Trinity makes sense of a relational, self-sufficient God. We see this when we say God is love. We're not just saying that God started to love when he created us or that he had the potential to love, but we're saying that from all eternity, God has existed in a loving relationship within himself. God is love and ultimate reality is a living and active God, not just a God of potential. Now you said earlier that the Quran speaks against the Trinity, but is there anything in the Quran that can help Muslims understand the Trinity? Yes, there is, because in the Quran, Jesus is called the Word of God. And the Quran also speaks about the Spirit of God being sent from God. And so there are some elements within the Quran that we can use to help explain the Trinity to Muslims. Now, others have developed a simple diagram for doing this. And if you have a look in your notes, you'll see there's God and the circle represents creation, the world. And what you can do with your Muslim friend is say, where does the word of God come from? Does the word of God come from God or does it come from the world? And you can say, well, it comes from God. And you can draw an arrow representing the word into the world. And what about the spirit of God? Where does the spirit of God come from? Does it come from the world or does it come from God? Well, he comes from God. And so you can draw an arrow into the world again, representing the spirit. And so you can show them how there is this relationship of God, his word and his spirit, yet only one God. There are limits to this, 
but it can be a helpful place to start. Okay, I'd like to finish up with some commonly asked questions. If Jesus was God, how can Jesus pray to God? As we saw in the last session, Jesus lives a fully human life. And so he's born, he grows, he learns, and he also prays. This is part of his humanity to be the true man praying to God. But it's also a reflection of this relationship between the Father and the Son in the Trinity. And so we understand both of these things when we see Jesus praying. But surely one plus one plus one equals three. Yes, Muslims have said that to me on many occasions. One plus one plus one equals three. And we agree with that. There are three persons. There's the Father, the Son and the Spirit. But if you want to use maths to talk about God, and I'm not recommending we should, but if you want to, then why use the number one? God is infinite in knowledge. God is infinite in power. Why not use the number infinity to represent God? And if we use the number infinity, then we see that infinity plus infinity plus infinity equals infinity. Now, I'm not recommending that we use maths to describe God, but if Muslims want to say one plus one plus one, then ask them, why not use infinity plus infinity plus infinity? But what about when people say it's all too confusing? We've sort of dealt with that already. But you know, when we go to be with the Lord, we're going to be learning about him forever. I don't think we should assume that God is just going to be something simple that we can master in just a few moments. We're going to be learning about our great God and coming to love him and know him more and more forever. Some people say the Trinity is just a pagan idea introduced by Paul and enforced at the Council of Nicaea. Yes, I've heard and read that on many occasions, but it's just not true. What the Apostle Paul teaches and this doctrine of the Trinity is grounded in all of the earlier prophets. Any final words on the Trinity? God is who he is and he is greater and more wonderful than us and has revealed himself to be Father, Son and Spirit. The reason why Muslims and Christians disagree is because Muslims only follow what Muhammad said about God, while Christians believe what God has revealed about himself in all the prophets. And so Christians can have great confidence in what they believe about God because we follow all the prophets. But I think most importantly, now that God has revealed himself, we should love God. For in the Trinity, we see that it is God himself bringing us back to himself so that we may love and serve him forever. Mm -hmm.